We'll get started today by building this Victorian kitchen table. The inspiration for this piece came from a visit to an antique shop in London. I'll show you that next, then how to build the table right here on the New Yankee Workshop. The New Yankee Workshop features the craftsmanship of Norm Abram. Well, today we're on Wandsworth Bridge Road, which is a highway loaded with antique stores, and it leads right into the city of London. And I'm at one of my favorite shops, the Pine Mine. And over here is Jake Foreman. Hello, Norm. Hi, Jake. Hello. I'm looking for a kitchen table today. Yes. A nice, good-sized kitchen table, here, much like this one. Here we have a lovely uh, made-up table, made with old timbers. So you made this one? Yes, they're, they're roofing rafters on top. Okay. And uh, this is old timber here. These legs have been aged in to match. So these were new and you stained them? Yes, uh, well, but we find it a good part of the business because uh, people like tables made to special sizes. Custom specifications. Custom made, yeah. Well, it is a very nice piece, but I was mm. looking for something that's maybe a little more historic. Yes, well, we've plenty of those tables if your budget will stretch. Well, show me what you have. Yes. <laughs> Jake, tell me, do you get any Americans coming through the shop? Yes, we've um, had one or two. <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we get a lot of Americans here. We have a lot that's of tables. Nice. Yes. What can you tell me about this one? Well, this is a good Victorian table, but um, if we look underneath it, we can see some oddities. Here we have um, these original legs probably would have been square, and they've been cut, and someone's put turned legs on instead. Oh, I see. They're even just Doesn't, a bit loose. Doesn't um, mean that it's a bad table, but it's just an interesting feature. It's not fully um, authentic. Not Do you fully. Have anything any older? Yes. Well, um, let's just go over here and have a look at a very early table. This is a um, late 18th century one. Wow, that is old. And uh, it's a good refectory table. Dark pine, wide boards. Lovely, lovely table. How much would a table like this run me? Uh, you'd have to give us about £2,000 for this. Ooh, that's yes. a little more than my budget can handle. <laughs> what else can you show me? Here we have an unusual uh, monk's bench table. Half table, half bench. Oh, that's neat. Uh, the top, probably, was made from an old door. Legend braced. Oh, so these would be uh, like the battens of a door. Absolutely. But uh, a good piece, all the same. Well, I'll keep that one in mind. Mm. What else you had? Through here, we have uh, a near perfect um, Victorian table. Oh, now we're getting a little closer. Right Turn there. legs. Nice draw at the end. Yeah, I like that feature. And beautiful top. Yeah, you know, this, th this top, is it authentic? I've seen a lot of tables that have been repaired using old lumber sometimes. Mm, this, is, this is definitely an old top. This is the real thing. Huh? Yeah, a good, nice Victorian table, lovely size. Now, how about the height? That's a problem yes, often. That can sometimes be a problem. They can be a bit low. So if a guy like me sits, you know, your knees get caught. Yeah. What we do is raise the legs. You just so add a bit to put, the bottom. We use old timber, and uh, that works very well. Mm. Well, you know, it's a, it's a nice table. It's the right size. Mind if I measure it up? You don't want to buy it? Uh, no, I just want to measure it. <laughs> measure up. OK, thank you. Well, I'm sure glad that that London antique shop is not any closer, because I'm afraid that I would be buying the pieces of furniture instead of actually building them here in the workshop. Now, this table is really a combination of three of the tables that Jake showed us. The leg design came from one, the overall size came from another, and this draw detail on the end from a third. But the only thing old about this table is the wood that it's made from. We actually purchased it from a sawmill in Florida that specializes in salvaging logs that have been at the bottom of riverbeds, maybe for 100 years. They bring them up, saw them into lumber, dry it, and then sell it to cabinet shops or woodworkers. Now, if you'd like to build one of these tables for your home, a measured drawing and a materials list is available. And you'll hear more about that before this program ends. Now, I also want to take a moment to talk about shop safety. Be sure to read, understand, and follow all the safety rules that come with your power tools. Knowing how to use your power tools properly will greatly reduce the risk of personal injury. And remember this. 
There is no more important safety rule than to wear these safety glasses. And before I left the shop last night, I glued up a couple panels. This one is made up from three pieces of one by six. This one is made up of four pieces of one by six. And they're going to be for the table top. Now, the reason I didn't glue all the boards together at once was because there are six joint lines. And that's a lot of glue to put on. And sometimes it starts to set up quickly. So I've made two sub panels. And now that they're dry, we'll move to the next step, which is to put them together. Now, all the joints in the top are reinforced with these beechwood biscuits. And I just make sure that I put a coating of glue on all surfaces. Because you can see right here, there are pencil marks, which were my location points for the slots that the biscuits fit into. And they should all line up perfectly. Now we're just going to put enough pressure on to squeeze the joint closed. Normally I let the glue dry and then scrape off any of the excess. But another method is to just use a damp sponge and clean it up before it sets. Let me show you how I made the legs for our table. I started out by developing this prototype leg. And to get all the appropriate turnings, I just worked from a very rough sketch with dimensions that I made while I was over in London. And I used conventional wood turning tools. Now, I could make all the legs for the table in that manner. In fact, that's the way most people would make them. You have slight variations, but that's OK. Now, I had a need a few months ago to turn out about 80 balusters for this old house project. And at that time, I acquired this lathe duplicating tool. And this really speeds up the process of making copies. So now I'm ready to reattach the tool to our lathe. Now a couple cap screws secure the duplicator to the lathe bed. Now I'm just going to take the prototype leg, which will become the pattern, and mount it into the device just using the same centers that I used to turn it. Now here's a 3 and 3 quarter inch square blank for the leg. And I've put a cross mark at the center. Now I'm just going to take an awl and give it a little centering hole. And next I want to install the spur drive. And I want to set that just using a mallet. Now, the temptation is to actually try to squeeze the piece onto the spur drive or hammer it onto the spur drive. And that's not good for the bearings in the lathe. That's why we do it off of it. Now I'm just going to bring the cup center into position and check it for balance. Now, when checking it for balance, I just look for any out of round spinning. This one actually looks pretty good. Now what I want to do is lay out the square portion at the top of the leg. And I'll just use a square to mark it all the way around. I found that getting a nice crisp corner on a square shoulder like this is difficult in turning. It often wants to splinter. So now I take the trouble to use a small dovetailing saw to just cut a little bit along each corner. That way, if there's any splintering, it'll only occur below the cut. Now, here's how our duplicator works. On one end, there's a cutting tool. And it actually can be removed and sharpened and honed every once in a while. And down on the other end, there's a little follower bar, which eventually moves up against the turning following the different profiles. Up here, there's a cam. It actually has different ratchet points. For instance, if I lift it up one notch, it moves the follower in closer and the cutter more into the wood, an eighth of an inch at each setting. Now what I want to do is start with the cutter just barely missing the corner, which is what it's at now.
Okay, now there's another eighth of an inch. One thing that I found that's very important with the duplicator is to always work from the high spots down into the valleys, not the other way around. Now for the final pass, I'm just gonna turn this follower just a little bit, which actually allows the cutter to move in just a touch for the final cleaning pass. Now one thing that the duplicator will not do is give me a perfectly square shoulder here because it has a tapered cutter. Now I don't want to take the time to take the duplicator off to mount a tool rest on that side, which I would have to do on most lathes, but since this lathe has a reverse function, I'm able to put a tool rest on this side and just clean it up. Now with the lathe speed increased to about 1,500 revolutions per minute, using a variety of sandpaper grits, I'll sand everything nice and smooth. The long rails of the table and the short rail that doesn't have the drawer in it are joined to the leg with mortise and tenon joinery. I want to make the mortises and the legs first. So I've set up my bench top mortiser with a half inch chisel and drill bit. I've set the depth to one and a half inches. And I've adjusted the fence so that the mortise will be a half inch in from the outside edge of the leg. Now on the draw end of the table, there are actually two rails, a low rail that fits into a mortise and tenon joint and an upper rail that fits in a dovetail type joint. Now that's the first plunge for the lower mortise. Now I'll make an adjustment to the guide fence position for the other edge of the mortise. Now with the edges of the mortises cut on both legs, I'll just simply clean out the middle. Now at the top of the leg, I need a dovetail shaped mortise that I was talking about earlier. And since I have the mortising machine set up, I'm gonna use it to remove as much material as I can and then I'll clean up the rest with a chisel. Okay, well with this mortise all cleaned out, let's see if we can fit it up with a dovetail tenon. To lay it out, I'm just gonna rest my rail blank over the mortise and trace the outline with a nice sharp pencil. It's always difficult to make cross cuts on long pieces at the table saw. So instead of using my miter gauge to start forming our tenons, I'm going to use my panel cutter because it has a nice long straight front edge which helps hold the piece steady. I've set up a guide block for an inch and a half tenon.
now the remaining cuts for each tenon, I'll simply make with my dovetail saw. With the prototype turned over, I can show you some of the underside details. Right in the center, there is a divider made out of plywood. And I chose plywood because the draw supports actually hang off of it. Now, this plywood divider sits in some quarter-inch dados in the long rails. Now, also along the top edge of the plywood divider and along all the high, wide rails, there's an eighth-inch deep dado for these corner braces which add rigidity to the table and give me a place to attach the top. The draw support as well as the top draw guide are connected to the short rails with biscuits. Well, now we're ready for some assembly. So with some glue spread inside the mortises and on the tenons, you can slip it together, a long rail section first, and clamp it. In addition to the glue, each joint is secured with a hardwood dowel and then capped with a piece of hard pine. Okay, with the short rail clamped in place, I'll secure it with dowels just as I did with the long one. Now for this lower rail, there's really no effective way to dowel it, so it will depend just on the glue. Well, we'll let the glue cure overnight and we'll easily finish this table tomorrow. I thought we'd get started this morning with the draw supports and guides. And the first thing that I'm doing is nailing these narrow strips on the sides of the draw supports. And they will actually keep the draw running in straight. Now with glue on all the mating surfaces and slots for the biscuits, it's a matter of slipping them together first into the short rail. This is the draw support. And then I've held this center piece out of the dado for the moment. I'm just going to try to engage the pieces. It's a little tricky. It's one of those times you wish you had an extra set of hands. Now we'll also put the top guide in place. And when I get them all positioned, I'm just going to clamp it together. Next, the corner braces, which are just attached with some glue, slipped into the dados, and fastened with some one-inch brads. OK, well, now we're starting to work on the drawer. And I've just made a dado. I'm going to show you what that is. This is the prototype drawer with a pine front and a cabinet-grade plywood box. And that dado is in a side piece to receive the back of the drawer. Now I'm going to reset the dado head to quarter inch and make the grooves for the plywood bottom. Now that takes care of the grooves in the side pieces. Now for the drawer front, I'm going to move my fence over three quarters of an inch. Instead of putting a knob on the drawer, I've actually made a little lip or finger pull underneath the front edge. And to make that, I put a half inch cove bit in my router, and it's an easy enough process. Okay, 
This is my dovetailing fixture, which I'll make the dovetails on that join the draw sides to the draw fronts. Now I'm going to start by making the tails in the draw sides. Now, by mounting the draw front in the horizontal position and flipping the fingers over, I can cut the pins. This dovetail joint is so strong that it hardly needs glue, but with the addition of glue, it's indestructible. Well, there's no better way to square up a big panel like our tabletop than to use a straight edge clamp and a circular saw. Now, to secure the base to the top, I'm using some inch and three eight long screws. And they're in slotted holes so that the top can expand and contract freely. And with that, all that's left to do to this piece is figure out what we're going to use for the finish. The final finish on our kitchen table is going to be a gloss water-based polyurethane. But that product is non-yellowing, and it's impervious to ultraviolet light which means no matter how much I put on, the wood is always going to look fresh and new. I want it to look old and rich. So I'm first applying a coat of this water-based stain that the manufacturer refers to as special walnut. Now when that dries, we'll put on that hard polyurethane. Well, here it is after several coats of that tough polyurethane. And this table will hold up to anything we can throw at it or spill on it. You know, it makes me feel good to know that we've built this table from wood that might have otherwise been lost forever. <laughs>